Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. So let's just start off by if you have any questions or comments, email us at barbelllogicpodcast at gmail.com. <laughs> Follow us on Instagram and on Twitter and all of those things. And let's just go poke the bear, man. Yeah, let's do the RPE episode. What right. do you say? All right. Let's do it. So RPE. The rate of perceived exertion. Correct. It's really just a subjective perception of how hard the rep was. Right. Or how hard the set was. I think Tushare got this from somebody else, but he was the guy that really sort of made it he, popular. He codified it and yeah. popularized it for sure yeah. and made an art of it. So the RPE scale is a scale of 1 to 10. And we really just use probably RPE 6 through 10 when programming training. So if you think about RPE, like how hard was it? Your things like number one and two and three are things like Napping. sleeping, right? <laughs> Standing up right. and doing nothing, watching Netflix, whatever. And so when you get to RPE 6, you start to talk about that's sort of RPE 6 is probably sort of heavier warm ups. RPE 6 is like five plus six plus reps in the tank. Right. right. So if you did five, but you could have done, I swear to God, you 11. could have done 10, it might be a six. Right. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. And an RP seven is going to be things like three to four reps left in the tank. RP eight is going to be like two to three reps in the tank. Right. RP nine is like one rep left in the tank. And RP 10 is zero reps left in the tank. So it was like an all out bone on bone grinder and you got it. You barely get it back in the hooks or maybe even you fail or you failed. And you would usually say RP 10 fail. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a way to sort of try to subjectively quantify how hard the set was or how hard the workout was for the purposes of trying to understand the total amount of stress of a workout on a client. Yeah. So if you're going to keep a training log and you should, you need to keep a paper training log because we're all good people. And you go back and look at that training log and you say, gosh, I did three sets of five at 315 18 months ago. And I just did three sets of five today at 315. What's the damn difference? Sure. Well, if you write something down about the RP, it might give you an idea that you've gotten stronger, even though you just move the same weight. You might sure. be able to figure something out from that. Yeah. So it is just one piece of one stat or one metric that we use in the grand scheme of things. And, and there are lots of different ways to use it. And we want to talk through those things today because there's been a lot of confusion about how we use it versus the way other people use it versus the way it should be done or never done. Right. <laughs> and uh, which is fine. And so let's sort of go down the, the line. So I have never in my life used RPE with an in-person client. Well, no, wait a minute. I'm going to wager that you didn't do it in an explicit way. I know what you're saying. Of course, I didn't do it in an explicit way. Because what is the RPE guide for when I'm coaching somebody in person? Your eyeball, my bar eyeball, speed, you know, my eyeball. all that stuff. Now, let's talk about bar speed for a second, because bar speed matters. As a matter of fact, bar speed is probably the number one indicator for how hard it was as a coach. I'm watching it now, but we can't compare your bar speed to my bar speed. No, no. Right. No. And it's kind of interesting because like we're both really slow deadlifters, but I'm a really fast bench presser. Too fast. Tear the bone off, tear the peck off the bone. Yeah. That's several several times. Right. Yeah. And so for a client that I have coached in person for months and months and months, Certainly, I don't use RP at all during the first two or three months of novice linear progression. The only thing that matters is that the weight goes up. Yeah. I don't care if 205 for three sets of five on Monday looks a little easier or looks a little harder than 210 for three sets of five on Wednesday. They does. still got to do it. It, it doesn't, doesn't matter, matter how hard it was. It doesn't matter. Guess what we're doing on Friday? More. 215. More. That's what we're doing. So in person, I'm watching bar speed and I'm weighing that bar speed against what I've already seen this person do for thousands of reps, right? certainly hundreds of reps. Charity has a client who is, I think she's 63 years old. She's a slight lady. She's probably five foot two and weighs 125 pounds. And she's squatting her body weight for five fives. Okay. Solid. Yeah, yeah you bet. And every single rep looks like the last one. Like not like the right. one before it, but like her last ever. Yeah, sure. <laughs> like she's not going to make it. Sure. Like 85 pounds is slow too. Right. Like they're all slow. Anything north of about 95 pounds takes her 10 seconds yeah. to stand up. Yeah. So Sean was with us and he was like, get over there and spot, you know, for mm -hmm. Louise. And he, and was, he wanted to take every one of yeah, them because right. you're like, she's not going to make it. Yeah. And somebody like her, everything <laughs> past looks like her last RP10. warm up is RPE 10. I mean, <laughs> yeah. She can't tell the difference. Yeah. So it probably doesn't work very well for a lady like that. And that's fine. 
But in person, if I'm coaching somebody in person, I've got a real good idea of how hard it is and the total stress on the body. And I also have more real-time feedback for in-person coaching about things like, oh, I was up late last night. I got in a fight with my wife. I was drunk. I'm hungover, like whatever. And so if you have to make some adjustments on the flyer, you have to understand like how the stress of the workout overlays against the stress of life. You know that in person much easier. Certainly we are sort of using RPE from a cognitive standpoint without actually communicating that to our client. We're making judgment calls. Because we were standing there, right? Now the question is, what do you do when you're not standing there? Yeah, what do you do when you're not standing there? I think if you're not standing there, first of all, programming probably has to be more conservative. Yeah. You can't take risks with programming if you're not there. If I have a young man that's coming to train with me in person, We can finish up a session on Monday. I can take his book and write down what the Wednesday and Friday sessions are if he's an intermediate. And we can be aggressive. And since I'm there to help him, you know, I'm his brain during that time. He just has to move the weights around. And I'm doing all the thinking for him. And so I can make a call if it's too darn heavy. Or on the fly, like after set number two, if you have to, or after set number one, or after the last warm up, or whatever. That's right. He can finish that last warm up and I go, "Mm, he must have been drinking last night, or he had the flu, or whatever, and we can figure something out. But if you're not there, first of all, your coach needs to not be taking any sorts of those risks. He needs to set you up for success. Now, you know, we want to put enough stress on the person, so we don't want to softball them. Yeah. But I don't prescribe RP in those cases. I will tell people who I trust, who I know that can push themselves and are honest with themselves, you know, if you can't do it that day, if you can't do it that day, if you do your last warm up, you finish your first set, you mess your britches and it's Yahtzee time, you can take 5% off. Yeah. The flip side of that is, especially for a little bit older people, hey, if you're feeling good, you better put 5% on. That's correct. Because that actually may may be more important. Right. It may not be there. And I'm kind of learning that lesson for myself more and more. The other day, you had me program for a triple of a a deadlift, and the math works out that it would have been just south of my PR. I called an audible and pulled a PR instead of doing the triple. It was about the same amount of stress. You did a five. Arguably. A five rep PR. No, I actually pulled the. I also oh. pulled a one rep. You know. Yeah. So the. I think the week before you pulled the five rep. PR, I did, you did the, the same rep. thing. You, you prescribed a triple, and, and I pulled like, three, and I, I, knew, I like, and you had two more. I'm like, yeah. I readily have two more, yeah, so yeah. I did. Okay. So I don't even prescribe RPE in those cases. I yeah. give them an actual percentage. Now, there's a chart out there. You can go Google and you can look up this yep. RPE chart, and they pretty carefully lay out RPE. Versus percentages of the... And reps. Right. So 88% for four reps is this RPE. 88% for four reps would probably be like an RPE 9 somewhere there. People that are using RPE, it's really percentage-based program. Yeah, so let's walk through what that looks like for us. And again, man, there's more than one way to skin a cat. We're going to tell you how I do it. At the end of Novice LP, as we're nearing the end, not like on the last workout, but as Mm -hmm. in the last month of what I perceive the last month to be, I will start having my client tell me what they think the last set RPE was. Right. So we start to use it from the client's descriptor. The client describes how hard it was. Now, why do you do that? I do that because they don't know how hard hard is. Yeah, that's what I do. I want to tell them. I want to tell them they're wrong. That's right. <laughs> they, they, they will tell me that was an RPE 10. I say, no, that's an RPE 7. Yeah, you got Maybe more. a seven and a half. You're telling me if somebody had a gun to your kid's head, you couldn't have eked out three more reps? Well, yeah, like, I probably could have eked out three more reps. He's like, which kid? Wait a minute. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, then it's not an RPE 10, right? So again, we've had this sort of clarification episodes where we had to talk about learning how to grind. That's not because we want our clients to grind on every single set of every single rep or every single day or all the time, but you have to know how to grind when it matters. Yeah. What's especially co- if you use RPE. Especially if you use RPE. It's, if it's you've never done important. a 10, how do you know what That's a right. 10 is? I know coaches that have used RPE almost exclusively prescriptively and they've gone back and watched their clients, and they've noted that 90% of the time, the clients screw it up. Yeah, They do the wrong RP. So you're going to work up to a single at RP8, and then you're going to do backoffs at RP8 or RP7.5 or whatever. Doesn't matter. And then they do it, and it's not the right RP. They look at it, and they look at both the single and the backoffs, and go, well, that's you didn't do it the right weight. Yeah. So this is important if you coach, because we are watching Every single heavy set that our clients do, then we can start this sort of process as a communication piece to our programming so that in the beginning, after the first two or three months of novice LP, we'll start to have the client report back to us what they think the RPE was. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is we're trying to, that's the word I'm looking for, we're trying to get on the same page there. We're trying to... Yeah, we're calibrating. We're calibrating, that's the word. Thank you. 
we're trying to calibrate what RP actually is. And then we are calibrated, but it takes a little while. It often yeah. takes a couple months to calibrate. It's very important when you've got a guy that's training by himself and he doesn't have a buddy cheering him on. That's so right. You've got one more. That's right. You know, so. you can do it one more, hit this rep right. Yeah. And then we will start to use RPE in a descriptive manner along with weights and sets and reps. So we'll often say, well, you're going to do this weight, right? You're going to, and we'll often use I it for- I don't do that anymore. I know you don't do you it do. at all. I don't do that. Yeah, anymore. I do. I like it. And I like it again because I want them to understand about how hard it should be. And so I'll, sometimes I'll do that and I'll say the exact weight. And sometimes I'll use a percentage of one rep max, depending on how far down the line of early intermediate versus late intermediate they are. So an example of what you do, because I've seen it, you might say four sets of four at 315 pounds. That R should be an RP8. Correct. So if you get out there and it's a 10. <laughs> then we got an issue. Then we got an issue. And at that point, then as a coach and you look and the guy says it's a 10 and you've been working with him a while and you so know. you can pull 5% off the bar. You can pull 3% off the bar. You can pull 15 pounds off the bar, whatever. But as his coach, if you trust his RPE ratings. Correct. Because we've already calibrated. 10, and you look at the video and you go, that is a 10. Then you know that you need to have a crucial conversation. That's exactly how's right. How's the diet? How's the food? How's, how's the wife? What's going on? Right. Yeah. It, it, right. So where does the stress have to back off? Does it have to back off in the programming? Or, or does it have to back off in the life? You're right. Like, okay. You need to quit your job. <laughs> That's right. You just sleep 10 hours a day. That's right. Eight hours a night, two hour nap. Move back in with your mom and dad. Yeah, mom perfect. Cook. Right. <laughs> so, no. And so I will almost always start that with the lesser important lifts. So I'll start those RPE stuff with the accessories and supplementals yep. before I move them to the main lift. That's the only place I use them now. You want okay. to hear a secret? Yeah. Let's you hear know why. Why? Because I don't care what weight they move. Because the you don't care what RPE they are. No, I don't even care what weight they move. The first week they barbell row, I really just don't care that much sure. the weight they move. So if I say, hey, this is your first week of barbell rows ever. Yep. For guys, so you're like. Three sets of eight, RPE eight. Oh, so you do that. Yes. But you, because but, what right. weight are you going to pick? Right? Yeah, yeah, no, I know. Sure. It's I'll a do shot that in the dark too. for me. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, no, actually, actually, it's not. If I'm going to have a guy do eights, the cross, and the barbell row, I'm going to pick for his first session, I'm going to pick 65% of his bench, something like that. Okay. Yeah. But I often won't even do that. Yeah. And I'll just say RPE8. And the reason for that is, is it doesn't matter that Man. much. I'm going to LP that row anyway. Yeah, we're going to make it a little heavier each week. We're sure. going to make it heavier and we're going to get yeah, there. I've done that lots of times, especially the first time they ever do an accessory movement, just to sign the that's RPE. That's a secret. Don't so that's a prescriptive it. RPE, but it's for accessories, right? So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter that much. We're going to do an accessory episode soon, by the way. Okay. Favorite, and we'll talk about how we do that. But yeah, so I'll do that. And then I might eventually overlay that onto the main lifts, mm -hmm. right? And then eventually I'll get to the point where maybe we do hit the singles. So, you know, there's a, I got to figure out how to say this. Let me bail you out. No, let, hold on. No, I know what I'm trying to say. I just want to say it in a correct way. Right. So when I learned block training, how to do block training, I learned it from Jeremy mm. Frey. Jeremy Frey at the time was the, probably the best power lifter in the world. Certainly was in the discussion, best power lifter in the world and was the top sort of sponsored athlete at Elite FTS. Mm -hmm. And he was a training partner of ours at Strong. We didn't get along that well. So don't think we weren't. Close friends, Jeremy Frey, one of the best workout partners I've ever had. Just didn't get along great, right? It's fine. Guy taught me a lot about block training. He learned block training from the Russian guys. He knew Ishurin. He had read all the stuff from Bondarchuk, all these guys that came out with block training. And in that first month or first couple cycles, the first couple blocks of block training is accumulation. It's high volume. It's five sets of five, six sets of five, seven sets of five, things like that. And then you go into the transmutation phase and the starts peeling off volume and adding intensity. And for a while, you're kind of high both. It's yep. really brutal. And what we saw was those Soviets never used a heavy single ahead of time. And what we found is as we got eight weeks into the program, we hadn't actually had anything heavy on our backs or in our hands. And so we started to play around with, well, let's do a heavy single based on feel first. Right. Okay. And then do our downsets gonna, based on prescription. You're going to do a single at eight. A single at RPE eight. And then do our back off sets at what was it ever prescribed. Right? So the back off sets are at 77% so this for is, five sets of five. This is week three of transmutation. Yeah, whatever. Or, or week two. Or even we would do it in accumulation. Okay. And okay. it usually wouldn't be an RPE eight single. It would be an RPE seven. It would be an RPE six and a half. It would be something that would be a little bit heavier. Have we done a block episode? No, but we've got it coming. Okay. So, so block quickly. You have an accumulation phase where you accumulate work capacity. You, Correct. You know, you might come out of LP. We never go into block right out of LP. But for okay. example, if you did, you're good at doing three sets of five, right? I mean, you're winded, but it's not wrecking you. Well, you can't just go to six sets of five, right? So you, you work into that. You work into that. So we accumulate that work capacity in the accumulation phase. Yeah. 
And then you transmute the ability to do all of that work into the ability to exert force. And you start moving that work capacity into the ability to do heavy singles. And then you have a realization phase where all of those strength gains are hopefully realized in PRs across. Exactly right. Explained it better than I could. That, trans- oh, yeah. that transmutation phase is sometimes called the intensification phase. So those are mm. interchangeable words. And the realization is also often called peaking, right? So it's the peaking phase. So yeah. Peaking so we'll, is a waste of time, bro. LOL. <laughs> right. Exactly. Whatever. So we would use that as the singles as the first time we would do prescribed RPE with, with the sort of RP8 Makes singles, sense. RP7s. The idea was just to like, you know what? Like we try to make it all scientific. Reality is like, hey, you're doing all your drop sets. So like, let's say you're a 700 pound deadlifter at a meet, right? Right. Well, you're in accumulation phase. Can you deadlift 700 today? No, no you can't. Deadlift. You might not be able to deadlift 600 pounds a day. You're going to pull right? a single at 615. You're, you're going to do... pull a single at six. You're going to pull a single yep. at 575. And you're going to do all your work sets at 525. Yep. Or 495 or whatever. Right. So the idea was like pull a single a little bit heavier to moderately heavier than your work sets and then back off and do your work sets. Now, did you expect a training effect from that? I'm going to um, say no. No. Much. The idea was practice. I just wanted to have practice with heavy weights in my hands. Right. Or on my back or whatever. Yeah. When folks get very, very heavy, you know, let's say they're working in the 80% range. Yeah. 78% range. Yeah. 22% difference between it and your PR. It could be hundreds of pounds. Hundreds of pounds, especially because you're talking about advanced training yeah. programs at this point, right? You're not talking so about that's novices. shocking. It is shocking. And then you also you get all this weight in your hands or on your back as you get into that late transmutation and early realization or peaking sort of phase or anytime you start to peak. And you start to actually get heavy and you're like, oh my God, this feels so heavy. Otherworldly. Yeah, I just want it to not feel super heavy and make that transition into heavy a little smoother. And so that's how we started to use that RP. Now, once I've had a client for a long time, then I might start to transition over to a little more prescriptive RPE at some points in training, but so not- A long time would be three years. Brett McKay's starting to do it. I've got, literally just starting to do it. I've had him for three years. And that guy's never missed a workout. And he hates it like poison. He hates it. He deadlifts 600 pounds. He squats 500 pounds. He benches 300 pounds. He presses over 200 pounds. He's a pretty advanced guy. He obviously is super busy, family guy, running yep. a successful business. I've had him for three years and he's just starting to do it. And he freaking hates it. Right. Yep. And so as a matter of fact, everybody hates it. So that's why actually, even for my programs that we have, the original templates we start to work off of. And so we'll take it like, look, let's just be honest. It's when you first get a client, especially if they're clearly not a novice, like somebody calls me and like, hey, I'm going to USAPL nationals. I was at nationals last year. I'm in right. pretty, you know, like, okay, well, I probably can't put them on novice. I might put them on LP for four weeks and just clean up their form. And, but for the most part, like they're not going to be on that very much. How individualized of their advanced program are they going to have the first time? You through? Don't know anything I don't about know them. anything about them. So right. they're getting the template now. After that first run, or if I've had them since they were novices, the vast majority of our clients, then you take the template and you start to change the template based on the person. And this is where you change things like, okay, if I have a high performing athlete, that athlete cannot train as high of a percentage of their one rep max as someone who is you, female, old, whatever. How dare you? That's just true. I'm very old and female in my yeah, training. That's right. It might be it, right. So might be age discrimination or sexism or whatever you want to call it, but it's just true. And so I've noticed that for my percentage-based programs, which I'm not crazy about percentage-based programs anyway, it's just hard to organize training in any other method than as a personal way to do it. Well, you could just pick the weights. You can just pick the weights every week, right? Yeah, but But, how do you do that? Well, from minimum effective dose, sort of. So if we're doing a minimum effective dose of complexity and you start somebody on LP and then you slowly walk them towards a Texas method or a heavy light medium, but you never go from LP to that. Yeah, that's sort of a secret, right? Like you might run somebody on back-to-back blocks and you LP within the block. Of course, you do it all the time. That's what everybody does, right? right? Like almost every, pull any advanced program, like each little micro cycle looks like that. That's part of the deal. And so we get to a point where with percentage-based programs, I have a template, but I might take that template. And if an advanced lifter guy is doing 84% for five sets of five or for six sets of four, six sets of three, the female might do 87%, might be 3% higher because they can and they need to to get the same training. Yeah. Right. Now that's another place where RPE can come in. So if you say, well, it's supposed to be RPE eight or supposed to be RPE (laughs) seven and the female comes in and she's like, well, wasn't that hard. Like, well, wasn't that heavy enough? Then right. time to push the weight up. Matter of fact, just had a coach, a lady I coached, some of you guys have seen her on the uh, YouTube channel. She just did daily undulating periodization with us. And that is typically a very heavy RPE-based program. I didn't use any RPEs for her. 
other than descriptive RP. So almost everything was, I think everything. So I mean, some of our accessories might have been prescriptive right, RP. Like this way, it ought to be a nine. Correct. Whatever. And then she would do it and it wouldn't be a nine. It would be a seven or seven and a half or an eight. And so she's, she knew. She's feeling good. She's good. a coach. She knows what she's doing. So let's bump it up a little bit. Or I'd chew her ass and say, next week, this has to be heavier. This wasn't right. heavy enough, right? Dude, she just took her squat from 230 to 260. So she had 30 pound PR in her squat, right? Her bench press went from 112 to 130. I mean, it's massive, right? Her right. deadlift is going from like, now her deadlift, she's notoriously been, she struggled with her deadlift in training. And then she's one of those people that does really well at a meet. Lots of people do that because you get all those people around you yelling at a meet. And she pulls like 260, 270, and she's going to be a 300 pound puller. Like it's just made a massive difference. It's right. because we've been able to push the right amount of stress for her. And a descriptive RPE was the place to go. And because we were able to use that, she was able now, to make moves. Now, wait a minute. So I hear what you're saying. But also, you would have caught that with your coaching eye, too. Of course, but I can't coach her in person. Well, but even you can on the videos. You could review a video and you can be like, you know, I expected that 225, three sets of three deadlifts to be correct. So slower than that. So what do you gain by doing power way? What do you gain? Well, you gain one week, right? You gain a week. Well, maybe. Right, but you understand what I'm saying. Yes. So we can either do it wrong this week and fix it for next week. Right. Or we can get it a little closer to right this week and tweak a little tighter next week. If the lifter is brutally honest with themselves and has the moral courage to do but it. But even if they aren't, then we didn't lose anything if from, they prescribing, from prescribing it wrong. Right. Right. So if I said this is the weight and it was too light or too heavy, then it's already a waste of the week. So this brings up something I wanted to talk about here. Most trainees that are using RPE, in fact, are not, I think. I contend that they are not. Sure. So they go into week two of their new RPE-based training, and they pull X at an eight Yep. for sets and reps, whatever number. Next sure. week, they're supposed to do X for sets and reps at 8.5. Yep. They look back in their training log. Sure, and they go up in weight. And they go up in weight. And they, they don't actually weight to perceive and rate sure. the exertion of course they're actually then doing something objective based sure. on what they did before sure so and I, they're I actually exactly not doing RPE. This. okay so what actually changes for us is and I'll, I'll do this a lot of times in my written description of what they're trying to do so if i give them an rpe number like a percentage and sets and reps and an at rpe this mm -hmm. i say you have to do the right percentage on set one right and then you can start to make the call and I'd like you to do the right percentage on all the sets or on the first couple sets. I don't want you to make the call unless you are way, like if you're off two and a half RPE, like it's supposed to be a seven and a half and it's a 10. Like, right. okay, now we got to make a call early. But for the most part, I have them do the actual thing and they don't start making the changes until, you know, the third or fourth work set. So here's how I deal with that. If you're not sure, text me the video right then. Sure. Yeah. I'm busier than you are. So you just don't care about people. Like true. Oh, stop. <laughs> I care deeply about uh -huh. people. Yeah. And I have too many clients in Thailand. I don't want to be, I don't want to be that, texted true. in the middle of the night, but no, yeah, I don't. Yeah. No, all those are great. Right. Yeah. So those all, the point here is this RP is not evil. When we program based only on RPE, we're lazy and we're handing people a template to follow. Like right. we can just print the piece of paper out. And look, if you're paying somebody $50 on Instagram for a program, what are you going to do? Sure. You know, like, that's probably what it's worth. They don't know where your starting weight's going to be. And they no, they're not know. seeing your lifts every yeah. single workout. So for that's us... That's probably the only way you can do it at that's that right. That's right. Yeah, that's probably fine, actually. But for us, RP is just another metric. It's a subjective metric, which is put clearly a step below objective it's metrics. It's in the like name. It's perception. The actual, that's right. Actual weight on the bar matters more. Actual tonnage matters more. Actual volume matters more. Like, all those things matter more. Certainly consistency and form even matter more. And then we start to look at the perception of how hard it was for stress so that we can sort of make sure we monitor the stress recovery adaptation process and we're trying to tweak it as tight as we can. By the way, none of that matters if you're not consistent, if your form sucks, like yeah. all that stuff is worthless. Yeah. RP doesn't matter at all because you've missed the meat and potatoes, right? These are like the sides you add. And so that RP can be used both as a descriptor from the client to the coach as a descriptor from the coach to the client or as a prescriptor from the coach to the client. And for us, we use the prescription-based RPE the least. Right. And when we use it, we start it with accessory movements, move to supplemental and eventually to the main, but it's way, 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 way down the list usually. I don't think there are many people that can actually use it as a prescription reliably. Let's, talk, not, let's talk about that. Okay. So even for me, I kind of know what I'm doing. Sure. Not completely, but I kind of know what I'm doing sure. in terms of my own lifting. 
I often have a very difficult time judging what an RPE is, particularly when it's heavy. So you can imagine most of the people that listen to this podcast are going to be novices or early intermediates at best. And so you can imagine if you walk out, if you're a guy and you've done 315 for three sets of five, and that's your LP ended up there and yeah. there you go. So if you unracked 405 as a squat and walked it out, it's so heavy. You're sure. going to have a really hard time distinguishing the fact that it's heavy and the pressure on the sole of your feet and what you feel on your sure. back from how hard it actually was to stand up underneath it. Sure. Now, I know that somebody that ends LP at 315 for three sets of five can't squat at 405, but for the purpose of my example, the point is, it's very, very hard for novices to distinguish just the stress of it being heavy Sure. From how hard it actually That's is. That's why to we don't use it rep. for novices. Right. That's why we use that time to calibrate, not that time to prescribe. Right. That's why it's so important. And that the people that are actually going to use this, first off, are such a small percentage of people that will ever even get there in their training. Very, very small, right? What percentage of people actually get to advanced training? 3%. Sure. I don't know. I mean, but whatever percentage. Yes. Sure. The point is this, the more that we can support compliance so that people are compliant and their form is good the more people we're going to bring into advanced program. And one of the right. reasons we've had to talk about this a lot and train our coaches up as much as we can, for our coaches who were very rarely coaching late intermediate and advanced lifters are now much more frequently coaching late intermediate and advanced lifters. Right. Because we have way more people who have stayed long enough to become that, right? So now, so we were doing online coaching as Reynolds Strong back in early 2015. And then in late 2000, I'm going to screw this up. We have a lot more advanced lifters now than we used to. And so we have more that we've got to learn how to do this with. And so, sure, three to five percent. I was talking to my father-in-law, Todd and Sean. I was saying that I think what you're doing and I'm doing, there aren't many people that have done it. Like how many people have had a hundred men from 45 to age 60 that have been late intermediates? That's pretty Very new. Yeah. There have been pockets of late intermediate men sure. in that age group but they lifted when they were young. Yeah. You know, there was somebody that's been lifting since they were 21 or 18 years old. And, you know, what we're doing where we have guys that have been lifting for four years and who are 49 years old, nobody's really done that yeah. much before. Yeah, not with a big enough sample size to actually start to really, like, derive things from. So we're having to learn some new stuff. As things. we go. So you've got the thing that you kind of try to look at what you think should work based on what the paper says. And you can look at what actually works. And those right. are, you know, and so we don't know until we sort of test the thing. So, yeah, that's the way we use RPE again. And that's, you know, just so people know, the only hard, fast rules we have with RPE is that we don't use prescriptive RPE at all for any novice or early intermediate. Right. And at that point, we start to leave it to the discretion of the coach and the lifter. And so we will often use descriptive RPE at the end of novice to calibrate and in early intermediate. And then at some point, start to use some descriptive RPE that switches from descriptive RPE from the client to the coach to calibrate. And then we'll start to use it from the coach back to the client to describe this is how it should feel. And then eventually down the road, if it's appropriate to use some prescriptive RPE, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, people that can actually use it for prescriptive RPE. I think one of the ground rules for those people is they have executed a great number of max effort repetitions with 85% or better form. Yeah. I would agree. If you haven't done a great number of those, and what number is that, I'm not sure, then you just don't know what a 10 is no. in a reliable way. No. Well, that's another reason that heavy, good grinding sets are important. Heavy singles are important because those are the things you really sort of learn about yourself. It's just not the same thing. your body through the paces, man. Even a really heavy set, five sets of five, it's just not the same thing as a heavy single. Those are two different things. They're both hard. They're both real hard, but they're different. And so this is why you see bodybuilders that can do so many like reps or mm -hmm. just hard, grinding, brutal reps. They don't know how to perform a one rep max. Then you see powerlifters who are great at performing one rep max that just don't know how to do anything five plus. Right. These are different skills that we must acquire over our training career to become better lifters. And just like we've said, we drive intensity up for a long time and then we can't drive intensity up forever. We've got to start driving volume up. Like at some point, the, the stress just has to constantly go up. The stress has to go up. And we've got to figure out how to do that. And we can do that with both volume and intensity and frequency. And then also by manipulating RPE to make sure that the stress in individual sessions is higher or lower based on what's appropriate for the SRA cycle. Yeah. For people that have very, very full lives, you're walking the razor's edge, you know, when you're yep. trying to get that work in. Yeah. And, and it can be something that can help us walk that edge, edge a little closer. Yeah. I hope that's measured and reasonable approach to using that. Agreed. Well, go check us out. Go follow us on Instagram at Reynolds Strong on Instagram. Yeah, let's at Scott Silver Strength on Instagram. You can follow at Online Great Books on Instagram. 
and send us an email and give us a five-star review and go subscribe on YouTube. We'll yep. make it worth your while. Thanks. Thanks.